guys, uh, good evening. How was dinner? Great. Right. 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 Physically, now we uh, we'll be spiritually. So, Pastor Ann, Sandy, come on up here. No jokes from Bob? Oh, yeah. oh there was no one. Oh, here. <laughs>
And so, Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts tonight. You know where we're at. You know where we live. You know what we need. And I pray tonight that you'll speak to each of us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Judges chapter 16, beginning in verse 4. Afterward, it happened that he, that is Samson, loved a woman in the valley of Zor, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, and find out where his great strength lies, and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to afflict him. And every one of us will give you 1,100 pieces of silver, so Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies and with what you may be bound to afflict you. And Samson said to her, Ah, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines, they brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke those bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. Then Delilah said to Samson, Look, you have mocked me and you've told me lies. Now please tell me what you may be bound with. And so he said to her, Ha ah, ha. If they bind me securely with new ropes that had never been used, then I should become weak and be like any other man. And then Delilah took new ropes and bound me with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And men were lying in wait, staying in the room. But he broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom. So she wove it tightly into the batten of the wound and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with you have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. And it came to pass when she pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death that he told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. But well, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sinned and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees. And called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. So he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza. They bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. The California redwoods are one of the wonders of nature. These colossal trees are skyscrapers. Their girth is gigantic. They are the kings of the forest. But nothing is as impressive as the falling of one of these redwoods. The cutters score the tree around the trunk. 
as they move the saw back and forth along the cut line, the cut deepens. Soon what was just a break in the bark becomes a gaping wound. The tree begins to bend. It leans further and further away from the cutters. Before long, you begin to hear the cracking of wood fibers. With each slice of the saw, the noise builds and builds and builds. It finally swells to a roar and the tree begins to fall. If you're standing underneath the redwood when it starts to drop, you get the impression that the sky is falling. A huge mass of branches and limbs start to move and crackle. Finally, the trunk explodes along the cut line. The redwood crashes to the forest floor with a thunderous thud. Folks who've seen it happen will say that the falling of a redwood tree is an experience you never forget. Well, tonight, I need to yell, Timber! We are going to talk about the falling of a redwood. Not of a tree, but the fall of a giant of a man. Samson was huge. Not necessarily in physical stature, but in privilege and in power and in effectiveness. Samson was a Nazarite, that is, he was a man dedicated to God. He came from a godly home, he served in a vital post, he was feared by his enemies, he was used by God in supernatural ways. Samson was God's strong man, a divine vigilante, a one-man Philistine wrecking crew. Samson was a red man. Yet Samson fell. An outcome that proves the old adage, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. That was never truer than with this man Samson. Tonight we're going to watch the saw slice back and forth across the core of this man. It begins with a small line scored around his heart. We'll watch that line deepen until it becomes a gaping hole. Samson begins to lean. He starts to crackle. Finally, he explodes. And Samson topples to the ground with an incredible thud. Look on the forest floor of history and you'll notice that many a giant redwood has fallen. Samson is not the last man to rise to spiritual heights, become mighty for God, and then come crashing to the ground. Especially in our day, it seems to be an all too familiar occurrence. Church leaders, pastors we trusted, men who stood for God. One day we see their name on the internet, another scandal. The church takes a black eye. We've all met a sense. A man who seemed to have it all beautiful wife, good job, healthy kids. A nice house out in the burbs, a cool car, even a role in his church. Then one day, he crashes. Moral, spiritual. A secret, sinister side of the man gets exposed. A reputation is destroyed. A name gets muddy. A family gets crushed. Hearts are wounded. An already jaded and cynical society becomes even more disillusioned. If you've ever seen a redwood, you realize just how majestic these kings of the forest truly are. They're inspiring. When one falls, it causes a certain sadness. And the same is true of a man, once used by God, who falls. Well, to understand the fall of Samson, four aspects of his life need to be examined. First, his vow. Second, his vice. Third, his valley. And then fourth, his victory. His vow, his vice, his valley, and then his victory. See, Samson is a lesson for you and me. God wants to use us in broad and in deep and in wonderful ways. 
But if we stray too far, if we let our hearts wander, God will put us on the shelf just like He did Samson. We'll be disqualified. First, to understand Samson, you have to understand his vow. Samson was a Nazarite. The Hebrew word Nazir means to set aside for God or to dedicate to God. Number six describes the special act of devotion to God, the vow of the Nazarite. It was a threefold vow. The Nazarite was prohibited to eat or to drink from the fruit of the vine. He was prohibited to ever cut his hair, to let a razor touch his head. And he was prohibited to touch anything that was dead. Thus, you would never see a Nazarite in a liquor store or in a barber shop or in a funeral parlor. And these are three places that get heavy traffic, if you have to notice. <laughs> Drive by a new strip mall, guess what you'll see? There'll be a liquor store and a barber shop. Funeral homes are everywhere, too. In fact, people are just dying to get in those places. <laughs> <laughs> Folks want a nip, a clip, and a rip. They want to rest in peace and leave this world with no regrets. But God instituted the vow of the Nazarite to make a statement that life is more than a nip or a clip or a rip. A Nazarite was the opposite of what this world values. This world is all about physical pleasure, the fruit of the vine, outward beauty, the style of the hair, and temporal, earthly greatness, this illusion that we're going to live forever. 1 John 2 verse 15 warns us, Do not love the world or the things of the world. The world around us has a value system. That's what he means by world. This world has a value system that runs counter to the priorities that God would have us live by. This is why John goes on to tell us, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not any. These two systems are mutually exclusive. God's values and the world's values are opposed to each other. And here's what he means by the world. He says, for all that is in the world, and he defines it, the lust of the flesh, again, physical pleasure. The lust of the eyes, again, outward beauty. And the pride of life, that is temporal greatness. Here's another way to say it. The world is all about feeling great and looking great and being great. But the Nazarite lived an opposite kind of lifestyle that reminded us that real life is lived on a spiritual, not a physical plane, that true fulfillment is found above and beyond, not in the realm immediately around us, but in the spiritual, eternal realm. Real joy isn't produced by distilled spirits, but by the Holy Spirit. Real beauty isn't created in a barber shop. It's found inside a person's heart. And every mortuary proves that real meaning isn't in the here and now, in earthly ambitions. There is a life to come. That's what ultimately matters. True soul satisfaction comes from eternal pursuit. Understand from the outset here, Samson's superhuman strength really had very little to do with the length of his hair. It had to do with his vow to God, not his long hair. His hair was just a part of the vow. As a matter of fact, if long locks is what produced supernatural strength, every heavy metal rock star should lay down his guitar and join the NFL. <laughs> Samson's nappy long hair was just a symbol. Samson's strength was due to his commitment to God and that God had made a commitment to him. When the Philistine army had Samson surrounded, we read that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. God Almighty empowered Samson. As a matter of fact, I believe the usual drawings that we see of Samson get it all wrong. He's always depicted as a Hebrew bodybuilder. Kind of a muscular brood, a Jew on steroids. 
But if that was the case, then why did the Philistines have to bribe Delilah to learn the secret of his strength? If Samson had bulging biceps and enormous pecs in his big barrel chest, they would know the secret of his strength. Just keep him out of the weight room for a little while. Just shut down his protein shakes. I believe if Samson were wearing a tank top, there wouldn't be a single ripple in the shirt. He was just an ordinary, run-of-the-mill guy with an average physique. As a matter of fact, when we get to heaven, Samson may just be the little guy, the little run of the litter, the little 98-pound weakling over there on the, on the sidelines over there when we look at him. But oh, the punch he packed when the Spirit of God came upon. Just ask the thousand Philistine troops that were slaughtered with nothing but Samson and the jawbone of a donkey. Samson had made a vow. Here's the problem. Samson also had a vice. Flip back to Judges chapter 14. Just a few pages. Judges chapter 14 verse 2. I want you to notice the very first recorded words that come out of Samson's mouth. The very first recorded words that come out of Samson's mouth, Judges chapter 14, verse 2, he says, I have seen a woman. <laughs> I have seen me a woman. This was Samson's problem in a nutshell. Hey, he may or may not have been an exerciser, but he was definitely a womanizer. He liked to chase the skirts. Samson had an eye for the ladies. He could slay a thousand Philistines, but not his own libido. It's been said Samson was a he-man with a she-problem. Let me say, despite what our culture tells us, life is more than sex. Oh sure, sex is pleasurable, but the pleasure is physical and the pleasure is fleeting. Whereas every human's deepest needs are spiritual and eternal. Certainly God created us with desires, but God expects men to channel their sexual desires into the love for a wife. This is what steadies us. This is what matures us. Marriage. Pursue sex apart from the responsibilities and commitments of a wife and it will enslave you and it will ruin you. Men, we need to surrender our sexual needs to God. The Lord expects us to give Him control of every area of our life. And that includes the rocket in your pocket. Think about it. God will meet your needs in due time. In the meantime, He has a work to do in you and on your life. So often, sex is just a way to escape and mask over our emptiness. Instead, God wants to fill the hole in our hearts from the inside out. Remember, a physical pleasure, listen, a physical pleasure will never satisfy a spiritual need. Never will. It may cause us to forget it for a time, but it will never satisfy. A physical pleasure will never satisfy a spiritual need. The key to real, lasting, permanent fulfillment is not contact with another person, but a spiritual connection with the God who made us. Did you know that the Illinois, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources reports that 17,000 deer are struck by motorists each year on state roads here in Illinois. And the peak season for roadkill is late November. Do you know why? That's the seasons when the bucks want to mate. The state wildlife director says this, the deer are concentrating almost exclusively on reproductive activities and are a lot less wary than they normally would be. And this is what turns a man into roadkill. <laughs> a man gets a little frisky. 
He wants to escape the pressures of his life. He's looking for a little diversion. So he logs on to the internet. Or he slips into a strip club. Eventually, a woman at work shows him a little attention. It happens so easily. It starts out so innocently. They can even meet on the worship team at church. Author Florence Latour writes, No good Christian man or woman gets up in the morning, looks out the window and says, My, this is a lovely day. I guess I'll go out and commit adultery. <laughs> Yet many do it anyway. Reminds me of the two monks that were standing by the river. A gorgeous young woman, she approached them. And she explained she needed to cross the stream. One of the monks, he picked her up, laid her over his shoulders, carried her across, and then set her down on the other side. She appreciated his kindness. But his fellow monk, his friend, was shocked. He was appalled. As they kept walking down the road, his friend finally rebuked him. He says, as monks, we've taken a vow to never look on a woman, let alone touch her body. At the river today, you did both. The first monk said, my brother... I put that woman down on the other side of the river. You're still carrying her in your mind. <laughs> and this was Samson's problem. He had a lust for women. And he got him into big trouble. On several occasions, it caused him to break his vow. In chapter 14, Samson goes to see the woman in Timnah. We're told in verse 5, he came to the vineyards of Timnah. Hey, Samson! You're a Nazarite, man. What are you doing in a vineyard? You're supposed to stay away from the grapevines. Here Samson breaks the vow. He sins. Notice verse 9. On another trip to Timnah, he finds honey in the carcass of a lion. He grabs a little snack. But wait a minute, Samson. A carcass? What about your vow? The third part of his vow was not to touch anything that was dead. That includes a carcass, by the way. <laughs> you see, long before his infamous haircut, Samson had already broken the other elements of his vow. Like the deer in Illinois, he spent too much time fixating on his lust for the opposite sex that he ignored the commitments that he had made to God. See, Samson poses a strange dilemma. In chapter 16, verses 1 through 3, he leaves the house of a hooker, a prostitute no less. He pulls up the gates of Gaza and he bulldozes over the enemy. This is such a quandary. He spends the night in sin, yet the power of God comes upon him at midnight. Samson was familiar with God's power, but he was a stranger to God's purity. How in the world can a man be used so powerfully by God and be so nonchalant about obedience to God? There's really only one answer, and that's God's mercy. God's mercy. You know, it is an amazing truth that God doesn't wait until we're sinless or until we're flawless before He uses us. God employs imperfect people, including you and me, God supplies us with on-the-job training. He fixes us on the fly. The Holy Spirit works in us and then on us and through us all at the same time. And this is good news. But don't make the wrong assumptions. Just because God continues to use you, that doesn't mean He approves of everything that you're doing. And this is where a pastor can get deceived. Since people still respond to his sermons, he assumes that the little compromises he's making in private are no big deal to God. That's not true. God is watching. God is taking an account. In the story of Samson, God is extremely concerned with Samson's sin, even as he uses him. And eventually, there comes a point where enough is enough. Samson crosses a line. One day, God's strong man will go too far. And the power he has come to expect and believes will always be there will suddenly be gone. 
Samson's life teaches us that there is a definite point. That there is a line that you don't want to cross. Cross that line and God says, disqualify. He withdraws his blessing. He stops using you and he puts you on the shelf. Jesus, the giver of the great commission, will put you out of commission if you cross that certain line. And here's the added problem. You don't really know where God draws that line until it's been crossed. You don't really know where that line is until it's been crossed. It's a pathetic scene, really. Samson jumps off off Delilah's knees, finds himself tied with ropes, flexes expecting to pop the bands like he always has, and nothing. Nothing happens. Nothing breaks. This time the Spirit of the Lord does not come mightily upon him. Author Oswald Chambers once put it, Sin enough and you will soon be unconscious of your sin. Another author put it this way, Sin is like a woodpecker. Each particular attack makes a lot of noise. But it doesn't seem to do much damage. But like a woodpecker, if you let it chip away at your life long enough, it'll leave many an ugly hole that never fills it. Here's a crucial truth. God used Samson to do mighty exploits. But his real mission in life was first and foremost to be a Nazarite. It was to model virtue. It was to be a representative of God's values to the people of Israel. And this is what Samson ignored. And it was his oversight that brought him down. He got so caught up in what God empowered him to do that he neglected what God had enlisted him to be. A dangerous dichotomy developed in his life. He was all about doing. And he stopped being. What about you? Is there a contradiction between who you are and what you do? You go to church. You sing praise to God. You teach a class. You want to serve as an usher. Outwardly, Samson served the Lord, but inwardly, a sinister lust lurked in the recesses of his heart. And he allowed it to linger and grow and eventually blossom. Rather than pluck it out, rather than cut it off, rather than throw it away, he never made an effort to deal with his sin. Comedian Jack Hanley, he's famous for his tongue-in-cheek humor, he writes this. There used to be this bully who demanded my lunch money every day. I was smaller, so I gave it to him. Then I decided to fight back. I started taking karate lessons. But then the karate lesson guy said I had to start paying him $5 a lesson. So I just went back to paying the bully. <laughs> listen, listen. That is what a lot of men have done today. For rather than fight this battle with sin, they just give it in to the bully. Hey, to deal with the lust in your life, you have to repent. You have to change the lifestyle that supports that lust. Then you trust God to repay, replace your lust with His love. You repent and you believe. But this requires humility. And it requires willingness. You see, it's a lot easier just to pay off the bully and give in to the sin. This was Samson. He ignored his problem. He never dealt with his lust. And as a result, it festered and it grew and it took a tighter and tighter hold of his life. It reminds me of the two hillbillies who chased a bobcat up a tree. One boy had a canvas bag in his hand. He shouted to his partner, he says, Hey, you shimmy up that tree and chase him down, then I'll grab that varmint and I'll put him in this sack. The old boy climbed up the tree, started shaking the limb. 
Sure enough, it didn't take long for that cat to fall out of the tree. His buddy grabbed the bobcat and tried to stuff him in that sack. There was a lot of screeching and screaming and hair and fur and skin was flying in all directions. The boy up in the tree shouted down, he said, what's the matter? Need some help catching a little old bobcat? His partner replied, no, I don't need no help with catching him. I just need a little help turning him loose. <laughs> and that's what happens to us when we toy with sin. When we tolerate a lust. That lust grows stronger and it takes a tighter hold. It latches on and it doesn't let go. And the longer we let it linger, the harder it is for us to shed. Ever lick a frozen popsicle? Keep your tongue on it for too long and what happens? When you try to, try to break it loose, your skin kind of tears. And it comes, comes loose and you pull it off. This is why a lust is called a vice. Because it gets a vice grip on us. Samson had a vice. And it led him to a vow. A vow. Judges 16 verse 4 tells us that Delilah's house was in the valley of Zor. But the valley I'm referring to is a spiritual place. When Samson moves in and shacks up with Delilah, he reaches a low point morally, spiritually, a valley. He's getting closer and closer to crossing God's line of no return. And he doesn't even realize it. Notice Samson's attitude in chapter 16. It's so cavalier. It's so nonchalant. Even cocky, if you will. He acts as if he's immune to any mistakes. He's forgotten that his power is a gift. That his influence is a gift. He's acting as if the power he exudes belongs to him and not God. That he can just turn it on and off at will. When Delilah asks him, tell me, where is your great strength? Samson just plays. Just toys. It's just a game to him. He poses these silly scenarios and then he laughs it off when God's power comes upon him and he routes the Philistines again. After the second time, you'd think that he'd know Delilah's intentions were to destroy him. You know, I think he honestly thought that he was invincible. That's what I think. That he had convinced himself that he was immune to the forces that destroy other men. That's for other men. Samson lived his life and conducted his ministry as if God had given him a free pass to do as he pleased. Beware when you start to think that the rules that apply to other men don't apply to you. Beware. Beware when you think you're the exception. God is not one. But so every man sows, he will reap. The third time that a lot of questions and Samson comes perilously close to spilling the beans on his strength. I can't believe he says it. I can't believe he even brings up his hair, but he does. He says in verse 13, If you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, I'm shocked he even mentions his locks. Here he's skating on thin ice. He's walking perilously close to the edge of the cliff. He's about to cross that line. <clears throat> Once a rich man, he wanted to hire a chauffeur. He bought a new car. So he ran an ad in the newspaper. Three applicants responded. As he interviewed the first candidate, he pointed out the window at the low rock wall that lined his driveway. The rich man asked him, he said, how close to that wall can you drive my limousine without scratching the paint? Well, the applicant was cocky, he was sort of proud. He said, man, he said, I could get six inches from the wall. Well, during the interview with the second candidate, the rich man again pointed to that same rock wall. And he asked the question, he said, how close to that rock wall can you drive my limo without scratching the paint job? The prospective chauffeur, he offered his, he, he tried to better his competition. He said, well, I can get within three inches of that wall, no problem. Finally, the last of the candidates was asked the exact same question. He said, how close can you get to that rock wall without scratching the paint on my limo? The man kind of shook his head and said, sir, 
If I'm driving your limo, I'm going to stay as far away from that rock wall as I possibly can. <laughs> Needless to say, the last chauffeur is the one who got the job. <laughs> See, Samson wanted to drive just as close to the edge as possible. He wanted to enjoy sin and its pleasures right up to the point of losing God's blessing. Problem is, he didn't know where that point was. You never know where God draws the line. That's why it is wiser. If you love God, if you treasure His blessings, it is wiser to stay as far away from that wall as possible. Don't even go there, man. Don't even toy with sin. Choose the deep down fulfillment of an eternal relationship with God over the passing and superficial pleasures of sin. Remember what we called them earlier? Paul called them the deceitful pleasures of sin. You don't want to trade what's sure and true for something that's deceitful. That will let you down. Well, sadly, in verse 15, Samson finally crosses the line. And notice the line that Delilah uses to get him to cross the line. She said, How can you say you love me, big boy, when your heart is not with me? What an infamous line. That line has got more men in trouble than any other line ever uttered. If you really love me, you would. That's such a stupid line. I mean, if a woman really loves a man, or if a man really loves a woman, they aren't going to ask the other to break their vow to God. They'll support each other's purity. Real love doesn't ask another person for a moment of selfish gratification and then toss them aside knowing it's going to destroy their lives. True love respects the other person. It values their future, and especially their relationship with God. Delilah asks him, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? And here's the line that Samson is about to cross. Where is his heart? Up until now, his heart had belonged to God. Yes, he's yielded to weakness. Yes, he's been guilty of compromise. Yes, he has neglected repentance. But despite it all, God was still willing to work with Samson. He had broken two of the three vows of a Nazarite, but at least he had kept the second part of his vow intact. No razor had ever touched his head. That's when Samson's hair, that's why his hair was so vital to him. It was the last remnant of his commitment to God. It was the last thread holding Samson up, keeping him from crossing that line. You could say his hair was the last straw of a weak faith. Will his heart hold? Will his love last? Will his passion for God endure? We're told in verse 16, Delilah pestered him daily with her words and pressed him so that his soul was vexed to death. She just wouldn't let it lie. She just kept bringing it up. Just kept nagging it. Kept pestering it. Kept badging it. What's the secret of your strength, Sammy? <laughs> hey, Samson could have packed up and left for Israel. After all, he and Delilah were just shacking up. There's no marriage here. There's no kids involved. Samson has no obligations here. He could just end it and go home. But he doesn't want to end it. Because his heart is now in the valley of Zorak. Samson has crossed the line. When he tells Delilah about his hair, Samson makes the decision that his lust for this woman is stronger than his love for God. He never says it. Probably didn't think it. Might have denied it if you had mentioned it to him. But in his heart, he has decided he would rather have Delilah than God's power. And guess what? Ironically, he gets neither. He gets neither. The Spirit of God leaves him, and so does Delilah. 
Samson might have loved Delilah, but in the end, she sure didn't love him. She took the money and ran. And Samson's enemies took the once mighty man prisoner. As you probably know, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but I'm a big Braves fan. It's kind of hard being an Atlanta Braves fan these days, by the way. But I was a big Braves fan when they were doing well, and I'll stick with them when they're doing bad. Hey, if the Cubs can survive, so can the Braves. <laughs> <laughs> you guys know who are cheering for losers, so can the <laughs> But I tell you, being a Braves fan, I remember, maybe you do too, the infamous John Rocker. John Rocker was the redneck reliever. He did an interview once where he trashed New York City and everybody who lived there. Well, the first time after that interview, the Braves went back to Shea Stadium in New York City. Guess what? Rocker got treated unmercilessly. And probably rightly so. Fans yelled obscenities at him. They threw batteries at him in the bullpen. He was brutal. But this is the kind of reception I imagine Samson got from the Philistines. They hated his guts. Remember, Samson had been their arch nemesis for years. Hey, Samson had slaughtered hundreds, if not thousands, of their friends and relatives. They had a beef with this guy. And now it's time for a little retaliation. It's time for a little Philistine payback. And guess what form of torture they choose? Or God chooses? Believe it or not, they poke out his eyes. Probably with a hot iron. And how ironic. For all his life long, Samson has suffered from wandering. Remember the first words that came out of his mouth? Or recorded? I have seen a woman. He had looked on and he had lusted for women his whole life. And because of it, he had never dealt with his problem. And so God deals with it for him. He loses his eyes. Samson becomes blind so that he can truly see. The Philistines keep him in chains and make him grind grain in the prison like some ox or mule. On special occasions, they bring Samson out into their temple to mock him and to make fun of him. To mock this once mighty man of Yahweh. But verse 22 shines a ray of hope into Samson's hopeless situation. We're told, however, the hair of his head began to grow again. To me, that is one of the most encouraging verses in all the scripture. The hair of his head began to grow down. Samson has slid so far, he's been disqualified from ministry, for even life in Israel among God's people. Like the removal of a giant redwood, great has been his fall. He has hit the forest floor with a thunderous thud, yet his hair begins to grow again. In, the, in other words, even after disqualification, it's never too late to re-up one more time. God does give second chances. He still loves Samson, and He wants to work one more victory in his life. It's obvious from His final prayer that Samson no longer cares about his own selfish desires. His lust no longer controls him. A change has occurred in his heart. Broken now. Humbled now. He sees that God is all that really matters in his life. The Philistines have chained Samson between two pillars that support their temple to Dagon. He's on show. He's being made a spectacle of. He's become the object of insult and injury. But he prays a prayer of desperation in verse 28. He says, Oh Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines with my two eyes. And God answers his prayer. Samson pushes over those two support pillars and the temple topples to the ground, killing thousands more Philistines. You might say, in his final performance, Samson brought down the house. 
Bibles. <laughs> Verse 30 provides the casualty report. So the dead that he killed in his death were more than he had killed in his life. His greatest victory came through his defeat and through his death. And this is the means by which God works victories in the lives of his people today. We find the power of God when we die to ourselves, to our lust, to our pride, to our selfishness. Jesus, friend, not you, is what really matters. Romans 12, verse 1 says, Present your body a living sacrifice. Not a dead sacrifice like Samson, but a living sacrifice. One that God can use. If you cross the line, then cross back over. Jesus died on the Roman cross, so you can, so you can cross back. His forgiveness, His freedom are for you today, even you, even though you might have crossed that line. Maybe you find yourself in circumstances that make you feel like a Philistine prisoner grinding out the grain. You're a mockery of the man you once were. Take heart, my friend, for God isn't through with you. His Spirit isn't scared or ashamed to come upon you at least one more time. He wants to use you again. But He wants you to repent and to turn from your sin and to stop playing and toying with these things that are going to destroy you. And if this message has reached a Samson just in the nick of time, if you've been taking shortcuts, if you've been toying with temptation, if you've been thinking that the rules don't apply to you, if you've been stumbling ever so closer and closer toward that line of no return, and nobody knows it but you, then please, come out of the valley. Repent of your life. Renew your vow and you can walk with God in victory. And you need to do it today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to make several invitations tonight. The first invitation that I want to make, I don't know, but there could be somebody here tonight who doesn't know Jesus. Maybe you were brought by a friend to come to this conference. Maybe somebody just said, hey, you've got a group of men meeting together. I think you'd enjoy it. Why don't you come with me? And you, you've come uh, not really knowing what to expect. You know, you you uh, you're, you don't. You, if, hey, if you have a faith at all, it's not an active faith. I mean, you, you're sort of a Christian. You're a, well, you're an American. You're a Christian. That kind of thing. You know, but you've never really made a commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. Let me just say that this is a friendly atmosphere. This is a this is a good place to make that kind of. Is there somebody here tonight that would say, Pastor Sandy, uh, I've never given my life to Jesus. I've gone to church my whole life. I, I might even serve in the church, but I've never given my life to Jesus. I, I'm kind of a nominal believer, I guess, but I've never really made it personal. I've never really said to Jesus personally that I want to follow you. Here's my life. Take it and use it. Is there somebody here tonight that would lift up their hand and say, hey, I want you to pray for me? Is there anybody here that would say Anybody. Just slip up your hand. I'll see it. I want to pray a prayer for you. Anybody? Lord, I pray for those here tonight. Lord, nobody's lifted their hand. I assume that we all know you. Or that we're all followers of Jesus Christ. But if there's someone still who's holding out, who's never made that decision, I know sometimes it's hard. It's hard to step out. It's hard to be bold, even in a friendly environment like this, Lord. But I pray 
that if there is someone here tonight who doesn't know you, that before they leave this room, they'll take care of business. And they'll seek one of us out and they'll pray a prayer and they'll receive you into their life. They don't even need to seek us out. They can sit there right where they are between you and them, Lord. They can confess their sin and they can put their faith in Jesus. And then I hope they'll tell somebody before they leave. Lord, now I want to pray for the rest of us. Lord, I want to pray for us. Lord, because every man in this room tonight, we struggle at times. We struggle with sin. We struggle with temptation. Lord, you, you know us. You know our frame. You know that we're made of dust. Lord, you know how weak we are. Lord, you know that there are moments when we get caught up in the wrong things. There's times when we get pulled away. There's opportunities, Lord, where things look too appealing to us. And, and there may be times when we make these little compromises in our lives, Lord. And maybe we've been feeling that our heart is going astray. And we've been wandering and we've been pushing back from you. We've been going the wrong direction. Lord, we've been doing it. Some of us maybe have been doing it for a while now. The problem is we don't know where that line has been drawn. We don't know where you've drawn that line. And, and for each of us, it's different. And we don't want to dare cross that line and you to withdraw your spirit from us and for you to put us on the shelf and for you to say, hey, I'm not using you anymore. Lord, we love you more than Delilah. We love you more than Zorik. Lord, we love you and we want to serve you. We want our lives to count for you. We appreciate all that you've done for us. We appreciate the blood that was shed. We appreciate the power of the Spirit that you so freely pour out upon us, Lord. We don't want to do anything, Lord, to lose that usefulness and to lose that influence that you've given us to our wife, to our kids. Our kids look up to us, Lord. They respect us. We don't want to lose that, Lord. We have a witness at work. We don't want to lose that, Lord. We realize that, that the tree could fall and that suddenly everything could be over. We could be ruined. Everything we've worked so hard for all these years, everything we've tried to cultivate and gain and build, Lord, could be taken away from us in no time, in one night. Lord, we want to get as far away from that line as we can. We want to rush into your safe arms, Lord. We want to find our safety in the vow that we've made to you. We want to be a Nazarite. Lord, we want to seek spiritual pleasure, not fleshly, earthly pleasure. We want to trust you to make us inwardly beautiful, Lord. We don't want to try to pursue some kind of outward image. And Lord, we want, we want to seek after those things of eternity, not worry about what happens here on this earth. This is our desire. This is our heart tonight. I'm going to ask the pastors tonight if they would come forward and stand here in the altar. If you're a, if you're a pastor and you want to pray for uh, for the men tonight, I want you to, if you would, come up and just, just take a place here in the altar. And here's what I'm going to invite us to do. Wherever you're at, if you know you need to take a step forward to Jesus Christ tonight, wherever you are, you know you need to take a step toward Jesus tonight, I want you to come forward and I want you to pray with one of these men. Maybe you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you've seen yourself slipping away. And maybe you don't want the Spirit of God to depart from you. You want to come forward tonight. You want to confess your sin. You want to pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit. God will do that for you tonight. Maybe you've already crossed the line and you know it. And you want to cross back over. You can through the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, we know that your word says that whatever we're going through, we know one thing, our brethren are going through the same things. And Father, every man in this room knows what men face. We know the temptations that we struggle with. And Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you will give us hearts for one another to pray for each other, Lord. Because Father, we need each other. We need to pray for one another.
Father, we pray by your strength and grace, you would fill us so overflowing with your spirit. It will push out every ungodly thought, every, Lord, sin that besets us, that, Lord, you would begin to work in us such a powerful draw to you, that, Lord, our offense would super exceed our defense, that, Lord, we would love you so much and pursue so hard after you, the devil would not be able to get a football. Old sins would drop by the wayside. Chains would be broken. Prisons smashed. Set the captives free, Lord, from the alcohol, the drugs, the pornography, and every other, the smoking, the gambling. Father, everything that the devil is using to ensnare us and to keep us from being more than conquerors, which is our birthright. Father, in Jesus' name, we come against him. And Lord Jesus, we pray you would drive the devil, Lord, from our lives. Even if it's only for a time where we can draw close to you and get stronger. So that when he comes knocking again, Lord, we'll give you the door to open it, Lord, and drive him out. But Father, we thank you for this time. It's good for us to be here. We have to leave the mountaintop tomorrow and go back down into the valley. But we pray your spirit goes with us. That, Lord, whatever demonic strongholds we face, by your grace they will be overcome. And, Lord, we will live out what we believe, that we will be more than conquerors through him who loves us. Father, we thank you for this time. We ask you to continue to bless our evening now. And, uh, Father, that these men would uh, minister to each other. And to uh, pray one for another in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, Amen guys.